So I'd like to tell you what I've learned from the Spanish flu pandemic in 1918. Very interesting story. Not sure if you know about this, but back in 1918, 50 to 100 million people died worldwide of this Spanish flu. Now, that's very, very strange that that many people would die worldwide just out of the blue. And there's several very interesting things about this, okay? Number one, uh, they didn't really die of the virus itself, okay? The virus was involved, but it wasn't the thing that killed them. Fairly recently, they did autopsies on some bodies that they dug up from this time period, and they found something very interesting. They found that the majority of deaths uh, occurred because of these two things right here. ARDS, which is acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is a situation where the lung is filling up with fluid. So the alveoli in the lung, which exchanged the oxygen and the CO2, uh, basically just filled up with fluid. And the fluid got outside the lung and the person basically drowned within their own fluid. There was also a lot of mucus in there. So the mucus kind of got stuck in the lung. On top of that, there was a super infection involving bacteria, okay? So the combination of bacteria with this fluid created the deaths. Now, there are some other things that were very, very strange as well, because a good portion of these deaths involved um, people in their 20s. Normally, the flu affects young children and elderly people, not in this situation. So I want to come back to that in a minute, but first I want to tell you what occurred about four years previous to this event, okay? Well, 1918, you got 1914, you had World War I, okay? That was worldwide. What are some of the changes that occurred? Well, we had a huge shift in diet because we had to transport food great distances and you have to preserve the food. So they did a lot of canning, okay? And by the way, when you can food, you really decrease the zinc in food. Now, is zinc important in your immune system? Just slightly. So we have the transportation of food change, and the food change not only occurred with the military, but it occurred with people at home as well because they did food rationing. Um, no longer did you have the variety of food, the fr as many fresh vegetables. You had several foods, a good amount of it was preserved, okay? So what does this mean? It basically means we created a lot of nutritional deficiencies. If you create these nutritional deficiencies over a period of four years, you, you're really gonna increase the susceptibility to getting an infection. Now, the next question that I wanted to know is what month did the Spanish flu occur? Take a while to guess. If you guess January, you are correct. Now, what is unique about the month January? January is at the peak of vitamin D deficiencies. And when you have low vitamin D, your immune system just does not work that well. In fact, vitamin D innervates every single white blood cell. And without enough vitamin D, the risk factor of getting lung problems like ARDS or pneumonia go way up. Also asthma as well. So vitamin D helps your lungs. It acts as cortisol. It's an anti-inflammatory, helps your immune system. And when you're low in vitamin D, you're at risk of all sorts of things. I'm gonna show you an interesting chart and I'll put a link down below. This is basically a chart of the seasons of the year and what type of illnesses people get. If you look at the winter months, you have a huge increase in risk of getting upper respiratory tract infections increase uh, relapses of MS, which is an autoimmune disease, and other autoimmune diseases, okay, because vitamin D is involved with that. Also, increased risk of getting Epstein-Barr virus coming out of remission, uh, rhinovirus, which is all the sinus stuff, type 1 diabetes risk factors go up, as well as an increased risk of getting bacterial infections. But not only that, children that are born in the winter months have higher risks of getting MS down the road and ulcerative colitis. And there's an increased risk of mothers getting gestational diabetes. Fascinating. So vitamin D is really, really important in your immune system. So as you can see, there's this perfect storm. We have a virus involved. We have nutritional deficiencies that are setting the person up for these infections. We have low vitamin D. But why did so many people die in their 20s, okay? Well, this is why. During that period of time, 
uh, Bayer, as in Bayer Aspirin, ran out of their patents, okay? So you had a lot of other companies coming in to sell and make aspirin. Now at that time, they didn't really know the deadly toxic effects of high levels of aspirin. They were giving people 1,300 milligrams every single hour for 12 hours, okay? And one of the side effects of doing that is pulmonary edema, which is gonna fill up the lungs with fluid, and another side effect is to increase the bacterial load. Now the combination of the aspirin and the vitamin D deficiency and other nutritional deficiencies all together was responsible for those deaths. So what have I learned from this? I've learned the importance, the vital importance of nutrients and preventing health problems. You see, when someone has a health problem, very rarely do they look at the nutritional deficiency condition that set them up for getting sick. But it is one of the most important factors in bulletproofing your immune system. But the problem is here you have people that eat junk food and they're exposed to pollution and toxins in the environment, but you really can't see a deficiency of something. It's kind of an, a problem of omission. It doesn't draw your attention because it's subtle. You don't have to have a major vitamin deficiency. It could be subclinical. The only way you're going to know is if someone tells you, number one, the importance in this link of nutritional deficiencies and bulletproofing your immune system. And also, in addition to that, the key foods that you need to be focusing on to make sure that you're not deficient in the first place. And for that, I put some links down below. Thanks for watching. Hey, before you leave, I just wanted to give you a little quick history on some of the books that I wrote. This was one of the first books. It's called Dr. Berg Body Shapes. It was my attempt at um, writing about body types. Uh, what was very interesting about this book is I actually did all the images myself. Uh, don't ask me why. Um, they look actually not quite as professional as some of the uh, images that I have in the new book. But anyway, this is my first attempt right here called Dr. Berg's Body Shape Diets. Uh, and then I wrote a book um, more extensive called The Seven Principles of Fat Burning. I don't even have a copy anymore, actually, um, because it's outdated. Uh, the next book, uh, I put about a thousand hours into this one right here called The New Body Type Guide. Major updates on the body types. Uh, I put a lot of energy into this. Uh, it has professional images, graphics, all sorts of things. Now, the problem with this book is it doesn't really describe what this is really about. Body types are only a small portion of what's in this book. And that's why I changed the name to the Healthy Keto Plan, okay? If you happen to have this book, you don't really need this book because there's some only very, very minor updates. But if you don't have this, you need to get this one right here. Um, this book goes into every single detail that you would ever wanna know about. It goes into the seven principles of fat burning, it goes into hormones, uh, the body types, the basic keto plan. It goes into intermittent fasting. I talk about the 10 fat burning triggers and blockers and fat burning strategies with a lot of details in every single chapter. I go into body issues that interfere with losing weight. Um, there's very few people that just have a weight problem. They have a lot of body issues, whether it's sleeping problems, uh, stress problems, inflammation, menopause. I cover that extensively in this book. Then I talk about how to get rid of stress and I show you a technique. Uh, then I get into exercising. And then I have a lot of really good recipes in this book as well. So uh, this is a good reference guide. Um, on my website, if you get this book, you get this one free. It's called Healthy Keto Intermittent Fasting. This is the shortcut, a uh, quick guide to this book. And uh, the reason I created this book is to have you within 45 minutes learn how to do keto, okay, in intermittent fasting, exactly what you need to do. Then you can fill in the blanks with this book right here. So right now I'm doing a special. If you get this book, you get this one totally free, or you can go to Amazon and get these individually. So I just want to clarify the difference between this book and this updated one right here. If you don't have this, you need to get this right here. That way you can get the exact correct information to do it healthily.